Our presenter is Emily Van Weerdhuizen. She is the Youth Services Librarian at Sioux Center Public Library, lo located in the northwest part of our state. She previously worked as the teen librarian at the Joten Kizu Public Library in Saipan. I had to double check my pronunciation there. <laughs> Uh, she's been involved in the library world since 2011, and in her spare time, she enjoys reading, running, and baking. So we're going to get some first-hand tips here. And Emily, take it away. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, I should set my quick timer. Let me keep track. I have an hour, right? <laughs> okay. So um, when I was thinking about presenting, this is the, the first thing that popped into my mind. It's my absolute favorite thing to do in the library. Um, I think food programs can be great for all ages, but they're really great for um, tweens, especially tweens and teens. So, oh, here we go. So, okay, I'm just gonna close the chat because it's gonna distract me. <laughs> all right, so I just wanted to tell a little bit about myself. Um, so yeah, I am a youth services librarian. The Sioux Center Library, like we said, so I do the older kids, uh, do fifth through twelfth grade. So honestly, it, it's mostly fifth grade, like fifth through eighth grade. Um, people who work with teens know that, like actual teens, are really hard to work with in the library sometimes. <laughs> um, I'm sorry if my internet cuts out once in a while. I've had some spotty internet this morning, so <laughs> we'll hope for the best. Um, so this is me. I used to work at the Judge and Kizu Public Library down here in the corner. These are my coworkers about the last day that I was there. I left in May Lab last year. Uh, here's a few pictures. It sounds that nice right now. <laughs> this is a sunset on Saipan. They have the best sunsets. And then this is a tiny little island um, just off of Saipan. It's called Managaha, the 10 acres. So, and for those of you who don't know, Saipan is about um, 135 miles north of Guam, so it's really out there in the middle of nowhere, the Commonwealth. And I'm happily married. So, a little bit about me. Uh, oops, oops, sorry. Um, so here's my contact information. I'll have it at the end as well. Um, you can always feel free to email, call, well, maybe email's the best now that we're all at home. <laughs> um, you can always check out our Facebook page, Instagram, but if you have questions, please feel free to email. So a little bit about today. Um, it's kind of a rough outline, but I'm planning on talking about uh, why food programs are important, um, types that you can do, uh, what I've done in the past, some tips and some frequently asked questions, such as if what if we have limited space or a limited budget, because I know that is kind of an issue for people sometimes. So you just kicked me out of my presentation, I think. Let's try that again. There we go. Um, and let me check the chat real quick. I just kind of want to see where people are from. Could you guys? Um, yeah, we've got them from all over. Um, uh, I saw Des Moines. I think Baxter was here earlier. Um, trying to think where all I've seen them. All over the state, yeah. really. Yeah. Clear Lake, yeah. Algona, <laughs> uh, yeah. London, Altoona, Hubbard, Shredan, Humboldt. Ooh. Yeah, everywhere. Yeah, you spread out. Cool. Well, I was all fun to see, to see from everywhere. So, alrighty. Let's, uh, let's see. Okay, so culinary literacy. So what is it anyway? I think it's one of those things that it's not the first thing that pops into your head when you think about literacy, but it's definitely an important thing because everybody has to eat. Um, and I really think it's an important thing for kids to know since I don't know how much home ec is taught in schools anymore. So having it in the library can be a really good way to fill in those gaps. Um, so my definition for culinary literacy is pretty simple. It's just using food to build community and develop skills. And that's really broad, but I think that's kind of the beauty of cooking programs. I'm sorry, are you guys seeing that? <laughs> Keeps jumping, popping me out. 
Yeah, the last time we didn't notice it, but this time we did see that it oh. kicked you out. Sorry. Well, you're, back. Keep you're good now. <laughs> um, let's see, where was I? Oh, yes. So I think that culinary literacy, it encompasses pretty much all skills. For example, I found this little that I want to read from the Culinary Literacy, literacy Center. It's, that is part of the Free Library of Philadelphia. Um, I'll be bringing it up in my presentation again. I, the Culinary Literacy Center is <laughs> my goals <laughs> for, for cooking programs, but so this is what they said. They said, nothing is more important than, than cooking. It is all basic literacy, math, and science. It is tactile learning and it is social. Food program, oh sorry, food and cooking present many opportunities to advance literacy. Reading a recipe, understanding the vocabulary of the ingredients, and cooking tools, knowing the math measurements and how to scale a recipe up or down, studying the science of cooking and growing food, and understanding the connection between our health and the food we eat, and exploring culture and history through cuisine. So, I mean, that covers basically every single topic that you can think of. Um, I think that's kind of the beauty of food programs. Um, so, it's really great for teens and tweens because. You know, they're just kind of starting out. Um, it's good to get a baseline of the cooking for them. Um, I mean, you're not probably not going to get a professional chef or a passionate cook out of every single kid, but um, even just those basic skills that they can use for later on in life, I think is really important. For example, I think every kid should know how to, for example, make scrambled eggs or make some pancakes, make an exciting salad, just those really basic kitchen skills. Um, does that picture not show up? Let me uh, try that again. All right, here we go. So why food programs? I kind of answered this a little bit, but I wanted to tell a really quick story. So here are some of the girls that I had in my book club last year. Um, we were studying the book uh, Love, Sugar, Magic by Anna Mariano. I don't know if any of you guys have read that one, but it's a really sweet book. Um, basically, it's about a family of witches who uses their magic to create um, baked goods. So it's very sweet, figurative and literary. literary. Lister. Can't say that word, forget it. <laughs> um, so at the end of the book club, I decided that they would bake some cookies because bakery, so I thought that'd be a good activity. And they loved it. So there we made no bake cookies. It was super simple to make. And then we had one more book club session after that. And at that session, they were like, can we have baking club? And I was like, well, I don't see why, why we can't. <laughs> um, and I still wanted to keep the numbers from them coming in for, for um, book club. So I was, I was asking, like, are you going to commit to it? Are you going to come? Are you going to sign up? And the answer was an enthusiastic yes. <laughs> so um, I planned baking club for this past um, spring. And it I had a limit of 15. And it filled up within the first five days of it opening. And the waitlist was had one spot left. So <laughs> it was really popular. Um, so I think it just kind of goes to show that, first of all, like when you, when you do something that kids want, they're going to come. Um, but also that food's gonna bring them into the library. So even if they don't come back, at least they'll have that one experience, a really great experience at the library. Emily, can you say the name of the book that you had used with this book club, the title and the author again? Yes, um, it was Love, Sugar, Magic, A Dash of Trouble by Anna Mariano. Okay, A Dash of Trouble was the subtitle. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, and these food programs are really great. Um, they can build social skills. I usually have teens, or these tweens work in groups, um, which I do recommend, um, because like we're logistically wise for purchasing materials. And I feel like most tweens like working together in this kind of setting. Um, it's a really great time to learn about other programs. Um, and baking and cooking is a really great conversation starter. It kind of breaks up the awkwardness, I guess you could say. So this could be a great time to be like, hey, so what have you been reading lately? Or 
what did you do this past weekend? And you can kind of like get some sneaky feedback um, while they're cooking. And there are so many other skills that are tied into it. Um, I'll get into that in a bit, but for example, there's chemistry, there's math, there's following directions, there's patience. <laughs> so there's so many other skills that can build into it. Okay. So you might ask who can run a food program and I believe anyone can. You don't have to be a professional chef or really even be good at cooking. <laughs> I mean, that sounds kind of silly, but I'm not a professional chef by any means. I just like it. Um, I mean, you could even just buy all pre-made ingredients. You could have a cupcake program, buy pre-made cupcake, uh, some candy, some pre-made frosting. You didn't have to cook anything, but kids are still going to have a great time. You could even have a waffle program um, where you buy Eggo waffles and toppings, and I'm sure twins would love that. And that's zero cooking required, so. Um, let me check my time here. Okay. So some type of cooking programs that you can do, and again, sky is basically the limit in this case. Um, you could do smoothies, you could do waffles, um, taste tests, iron chef programs, pancake art, ice cream, cupcake decorating, you could do cookie decorating. Um, you could tie it into book, cookbook clubs, book clubs. I mean, you could do a Harry Potter taste test, the Lord of the Rings taste test. You could probably pick any book that kids are reading right now and pull something food related out of it. So really there's so many options, <laughs> whatever fits your community and your budget. Okay. So some programs that I've done in the past. Um, at Secret Science of Ice Cream, I have done actually um, officially two times and unofficially one time. <laughs> um, I did it once in my, my previous library in Saipan. And then after I did it, I kind of became the official like ice cream maker. <laughs> so I did it a few more times after that. And I also did it at the Susan Library. And that one, that's just exploring how ice cream is made. They get to make their own ice cream, but then they also talk about the different factors that go into it. So there's a lot of STEM as well. So that's pretty fun. Um, I've done cupcake wars, chocolate taste test, cupcake decorating, cookie decorating, um, baking club um, was this semester. As you can see, I did cookies, brownies, and we were going to do cupcakes, but it was canceled due to um, COVID-19. <laughs> which was super sad because this was the one they really wanted to do. Because at Brownies, they asked me, like, well, what are you going to do next time? And honestly, I didn't have anything planned. So I was like, I don't know. What do you want to do? And they said, we want to make cupcakes. I'm like, okay. And then they asked me, like, can we even make the frosting? And I'm like, yes, we can even make the frosting. <laughs> so it's pretty sad. <laughs> Um, I've tied it to book clubs, and then I was going to do a taste test, but that was also canceled. Um, but I mean, I can always do it next fall, hopefully. So, some pictures. Um, let's see. So, the middle ones here are we made brownies, and on the edges, we made um, cookies. And it is all girls there, but so it's not limited to the girls, <laughs> um, just no boys signed up. So actually that is one of my goals is to um, engage boys more, especially with food. Um, I'm guessing I'd have to do more gross food things to get them to come. <laughs> um, so let's see, next. Um, some are pictures from the book club that we did last fall. They really liked that, it was a super simple recipe. Um, I had gotten a hot plate um, for my budget and everything else there I brought from home. So, <laughs> And Emily, I'm just going to interrupt right now. I was going to wait till the end, but you just mentioned, um, I don't know if you want to go back to that last slide. You said you brought in a hot plate. I've told librarians all along, what do you need to do a cooking program? You need a table and you need a hot plate or a yeah. toaster oven or a microwave. So you don't have to have a full-fledged kitchen in your library. Somebody was lamenting, oh, I couldn't bake anything because I don't have an oven. Um, but there's oh, so yeah. many 
portable ways you can do this now um, that does your library have an oven or are you relying predominantly on the little appliances that you're bringing in? Only appliances. We don't have any ovens. Well, believe me, I wish I did have an oven, but <laughs> that'd be great. Yeah, um, great. All right. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but it just tied in with that picture and what you had said about the hot plate. Oh, yeah. No problem. Yes. I was looking to see a check with. And the hot plate wasn't that expensive. I think it was probably like, I don't know, fifteen dollars, ten dollars. I, I mean, say, it really they, they're on less price. than twenty dollars, I think. And I know sometimes yeah. you can get a hot plate that's a double one, so mm -hmm. uh, there are different options out there. Yeah. So really, you don't need a full kitchen. It'd be nice, believe me. But <laughs> um, and then we did um, cupcake decorating. This was for the last summer's program. Um, imagine or. Universal Stories, sorry. So we re recreated Van Gogh's um, Star Night with Cupcakes. And then I also brought in um, this girl, I don't know if you can see my pointer, but um, this teen right here, she has her own cupcake business. She's a seventh grader, which I think is <laughs> super impressive. Um, but she came in and she helped kind of lead the kids a little bit. Um, program was very fun, but it was a ton of work. <laughs> because I had to um, color all that frosting myself. So. <laughs> all right, so I just wanna talk about how a typical program usually runs for me. Again, it really depends on your library and like what your kids are like, but this is how it's worked for me. So I usually have a welcome, you know, as they come in a chat. Oh, and I should mention that I always do half the recipe, so each group makes a half recipe. And I find that um, that's like plenty of food for them. And it also cuts, on, cuts down on the amount of ingredients you need. And I think logistically wise, it just works better. Um, I typically have like a large U of the tables. And they sit around that when they come in. Um, I do recommend that, they, that you have them come in, sit down. Um, I have a theory that um, when kids come in and sit down at the table, it kind of like triggers that response of sit down and listen, and I think because of school. <laughs> so I think it's really helpful to have them actually come down and sit at a table before you get started. Um, so I've typically done three groups. So this baking club was 15 kids. I um, usually got 10 to 12 kids, which is actually a great number. <laughs> um, so then I do intro and ground rules. My ground rules are if you make a mess, you clean it up. Um, be respectful of yourself, of the library, of others, and then lastly, have fun. Um, and then they're required to wash their hands or at least use hand sanitizer. And then uh, I go through the recipe. So for example, if they're making brownies and they needed, I don't know, some packed brown sugar, I'd be like, okay, so make sure you pack your brown sugar here and make sure you're double checking your, your measuring spoons. Um, and I just let them bake. Um, I did put on there, know your audience, because I know that just letting them go in and baking by themselves <laughs> might not work for every group. It really depends on your kids, um, and what you're planning on. So if you do want more structure, make sure you're, um, for example, being like, all right, so now we're going to add the flour. Everybody add their flour. Okay. Now we add our sugar. But, um, I have found that the kids that come to my baking club, and my um, food programs are pretty good about that. So, um, so then I do activities while the recipes are baking. Otherwise, I can get kind of rowdy. And then before they leave, I have them do three things. So they have to throw away their trash. They have to wipe the area with a Clorox wipe. And then they have to stack their dirty dishes neatly. Um, I'm not gonna make them wash the dishes. We have this tiny little kitchenette and I don't think that would work very well, but I figure as long as they're piled up neatly, it's fine. And then they can enjoy their baked goods and they divide it, they divide it up amongst themselves. And I have to say, these kids are so good at dividing up the things equally. So let's say they have a pan of brownies and they have a group of four. So they will be so precise. <laughs> to make sure they each have the exact equal amount of brownie. <laughs> so 
So I let them divide it up however, however they want. And then I do have the full recipe near the door and they can take that. Um, and I also display the cookbooks and then anything else that's relevant to baking Emily, or library. You said that the kids are doing activities while the recipes are baking. What kinds of activities are you doing? Someone wants to know. Yeah, so I've done a few. One of them I have done, I actually got from my grandma. Um, I had asked her, how do you teach me how to, like the differences between the measuring spoons? I figured grandma can't be wrong, right? So she suggested that you have a measure out. Let's see. So I think I had a half tablespoon and a half teaspoon and a half cup, and then measured water into each of the cups, and they compared the differences. And then I asked them, like, well, imagine if you had something really strong, for example, I don't know, something really strong, and you put in a half cup instead of a half teaspoon, like how that would change your recipe. Um, so that's one activity. I've had a following directions uh, worksheet, which some of you might have seen before. It's one of the ones where they say, um, like, read this whole, read all the instructions first, and then you have to do them all. And at the very end, it says, go back to number two and just do it, and then turn off your paper. Well, of course, no one followed the directions, and it was very fun to watch. Um, and that was to let them know, well, you should always read your recipe before you start. So, and I've also done a baking soda and baking powder experiments and like seeing if how they react and if they're fresh or not. Um, I could also see an activity of like building your plate, like putting in some vegetables, protein, um, and maybe discussing that. I haven't done that personally, but I could see that being a good one as well. Does that answer the question? Nope. Yeah, that's great. Um, and we have a couple more questions, but I'm going to save them for the end. So. Okay, sounds good. Um, okay. So yes, here's some tips that I found. Um, I tried to make this practical for you guys. I find that for me, presentations that have the practical tips are most helpful, so I tried to give you the practical <laughs> things that I have found. Um, so one tip, I have activities for them to do while it bakes, which I talked about. So for example, you could do the following directions worksheet. You can make that up on your own, or you could find one. A measuring activity would be good. Um, making them clean up. Um, I honestly didn't used to make them clean up. <laughs> and then I realized, well, that's a really important skill for them to learn. So they should learn to clean up. And it helped me because then I don't have to spend an hour to an, an hour like cleaning up after them. <laughs> so um, you got to have them learn about building a plate and make healthy choices. There's some tips there. And then I have some more tips. If I can get to the next slide. It seems to have, okay, here we go. Um, so let's see if I get this pronounced right. Mise en place, I think. Um, it's a French word that means everything in its place or putting it into place. Um, I recommend that you have them do it. That's basically where you have a measure out everything ahead of time and then they just dump as they needed, as needed. Um, it's helpful because it makes it go quicker and it also forces them to look through the entire recipe. I have to admit that um, a few times I get so excited that I forget to make them do it. <laughs> and it still works, but I find that it's, uh, it, makes, it does make it go more efficiently if they measure out. And then along with that, if you have trickier ingredients to measure, for example, Crisco, um, pre-measuring that ahead of time really helps. Um, I mean, you can have them do it. I don't know, it is kind of tricky to measure it out. And so we have had it in little bowls and they just dumped it in. So if you have ingredients like that, um, consider pre-measuring that. Um, uh, if possible, provide each group with all the ingredients instead of sharing. I know that's not always um, feasible because of your budget, or anything else, but it is handy when they each have maybe their own bag of flour or a bag of sugar. Um, for baking club this past time, I bought 
just a little bag of flour for each group and a bag of sugar. And I think I bought a thing of cocoa powder as well. And then I had to share all the rest. Um, it works for them to share, but it is nice when they have their separate ones. Um, always keep paper towels handy and Clorox wipes. <laughs> Thankfully, I haven't had too many big messes, but the time is probably coming. <laughs> um, and also, if you want to keep your floors clean, if you have carpets, you can put that on a mat. You can put that on an old tarp. Um, we just got carpets and new carpets in our library in October. Um, however, I haven't been too concerned so far since um, flower vacuums up pretty easily. So if I were to have something a little bit messier, I'd probably put down a mat or something. Um, have an assistant, like really have an assistant. <laughs> it is so helpful. Um, my assistant, I ha asked my coworker to help with me. Um, she helps like comers get started. There's always one who, one or two that walks in late. Um, uh, she runs errands if needed. I mean, I try to get everything gathered up, but I sometimes just forget something. Um, she helps kids if they run stuck. And on that point, whoever you ask to be your assistant should at least um, know the recipe or you should, you should at least send them a recipe so that they know what they're doing. And it's best if you can find an assistant who is familiar with baking and cooking so that way they already know what they're doing. <laughs> Which is not to say people who don't know can't assist, but yeah. And then they just do general crowd, crowd control as well. Um, also display and promote your library's cookbook collection. Um, we also have cake pans that we just started circulating maybe a month or so ago. Um, so we've been trying to promote those. Um, my coworker also, the assistant, she is so creative. She made a little um, video using those cake pans. It was one of those videos, I don't know, you've seen on Facebook with those tasty videos that you just see that their hands moving really fast. Um, so she made one of those and demonstrated our cake pans. So I thought that was pretty, pretty clever. And make sure you have a fire, extri fire extinguisher nearby, <laughs> or at least know where it is. Um, heaven forbid something happens, but I would, I'm sure that you'd rather not need it, and, but know where it is. So. All right. Um, Oh, question here. They, so they ask how long your cooking club usually lasts. And it, it's an hour. But honestly, it's um, been a little bit shorter than that. I have, oh, I forgot to mention with my baking club, I actually have two toaster ovens. One I bought, and then I think it was on sale at Kohl's, maybe around New Year's. And then the other I borrowed from my coworker's sister, which is super handy to have more than one because that cuts down on a ton of the cooking time, um, especially since a lot of our pans, I think there were, so the pans that I got, they could fit inside the side, so I could bake two batches at once. So actually the cooking went pretty fast, um, but they did last an hour. So I hope that answers that question. Let's see, certain age. Um, I have grades. So I have, let's see, my baking club was fourth through sixth grade. And the only reason why I did those grades was because my book club last semester was fourth through sixth grade. It was a tween book club. And I didn't feel like since they requested it, I didn't want to limit to fifth grade <laughs> since the fourth graders were the ones requesting it. So I kept it to the same grades as the book club. Um, so I was fourth through sixth grade, but you could easily do other older grades as well. Oops. Okay. So some ideas for tying this into other um, topics. Um, as was kind of mentioned before, there are so many different topics that you can tie into it. I would love, love to do some really broad um, projects where they grow their own food and then they can cook it and bake it. I know that's there's a lot of logistics involved in that, but I think that'd be so cool. 
because they could have the biology aspect, chemistry, culinary skills, gardening, patience again. <laughs> um, you gotta have some STEM food topics. Um, this summer I'm gonna have a, well, hopefully, if we're all, we can see people again, I'm hoping to have a um, STEM and food topic or right, program. Um, I can, you can include molecular astronomy. Um, you could use solar power to cook things. You could do the browning effect. And if you wanna, later on, there's a cool video about that. And then literally anything baking can be tied into STEM. <laughs> it's all chemistry. Um, language learning, all right, so I did wanna show you guys this, this link. Um, I did pull off my computer, so language learning. Um, uh, let's see. This one here. Okay, so this is the liter Culinary Literary Center from the Free Library of Philadelphia. This is like my favorite place to go <laughs> online. So they have um, something called the Edible Alphabet here. I think it's so cool. So they are using food to help English language learners. And I think that's so cool because everybody eats and it's kind of like a, it, it's, it's the commonize, commonizer, uh, there's a different word that I'm blanking on. But um, I don't know, this is just an example. They have more examples on their website, but I just wanted to show that quick. Um, let's see. Equalizer, that's the word I was thinking of. <laughs> um, and then you could have cookbook food programs or um, book clubs, book programs. Like I said before, you could cook food from Harry Potter. Another program I'm gonna hopefully do this summer is a um, um, fantasy food place test. So I think you could make butter beer, um, you can make you could try to make lemon bread. I'm not sure how you how you do that, but <laughs> um, there's some examples there. Okay, so I better check. See how much time I have left. Okay. Um, so some frequently asked questions that I'm thinking people might have. Um, I know budgets can be limited, and like space can be limited, and then there's the food safety allergies question. So first of all. If you have no or limited budget, some things I would suggest, um, actually first, um, yes, let me talk and then I'll show you that, the link next. Um, so making recipes with as few ingredients as possible, there are a ton of recipes out there. You could just pop it into Pinterest and I'm sure you'd come up with hundreds. For example, you can make banana pancakes, which is usually just eggs, oats, and bananas super simple. Um, granola is very simple. Oats, honey, oil, cinnamon. I actually just did a video on that on our library website if you want to check that out. <laughs> um, three ingredient brownies, eggs, Nutella flour, and then there are so many more. I'd also recommend planning out all your recipes at once. So for example, if you're having three sessions, planning out those recipes and then making sure that the ingredients are overlapping. So for example, if you are making banana pancakes one time, granola another time, use oatmeal for both of those. And oatmeal is really cheap. So so there you've already um, saved some money. And use common ingredients. Um, some of the things I use most are peanut butter, oatmeal, vanilla, and honey. And I know some people have um, nut allergies, so if you know about that in your community, then obviously stay away from nuts. Um, but I do find that peanut butter goes in a lot of things, so. <laughs> um, you might have to get creative. Uh, if you're using frozen fruit, frozen fruit is generally a little bit cheaper than, um, well, it's more cost effective than fresh fruit. You can put that in smoothies, in parfaits, you can mix the granola and then put it in a parfait. <laughs> um, there's so many ways. You can put it in pancakes. And don't be afraid to ask for donations as well. If there's one thing that I've learned from working in libraries is that never be afraid to ask. 
I've had some times where I've asked somebody, someone in the community for something and expecting to hear like nothing or a no or anything. Um, and I had it once where I had it for a craft and I had requested wood from a local lumber yard and they cut it and they even delivered it for us. So like, don't be afraid to ask. Somebody um, posted in the comments earlier that she asked for some cooking utensils, um, mm -hmm. appliances and, and got very good response to it. So I would think asking for donations of some food, Hey, I need five, five pound bags of flour. I bet you'll get 10. Yeah. <laughs> and if you exactly. got, if you're, privileged enough to have a local grocer in town maybe there's a way they'll give you a slight discount if you're buying on the library account too that would be something worth asking for at least mm -hmm. exactly or if you have um farmers markets that would be a really great place to tap into um even if it's not necessarily cheaper it's also good to support those local businesses <laughs> um and you'll get the fresher food too um and so then as utensils, okay, this is where I want to show you that link. Um, let's see. I think it is, okay, this one here. This is a toolkit put out by the Culinary Literacy Center, which I keep referencing. <laughs> I recommend they check it out. Um, it's quite long, so I'm not obviously going to go through it all, but I wanted to show you one note that they have in there i think is really cool so they're talking about so they have a commercial grade kitchen which i mean sounds like the best thing ever um so they have different levels so obviously if you have a huge budget you can get a huge kitchen most of us don't so another level you could have a mobile kitchen unit which is just a little smaller you can do some really great outreach things with that or you can just do a kitchen in a box which is just having a few um a few tools and here this is what they suggest for their kitchen in a box um, honestly this is a ton of stuff and I don't think a lot of this is necessary unless you're gonna do some really heavy baking and cooking um, things that I would suggest that you have are some bowls some wire whisks or whisking spoons or I mean you could just use plastic utensils I mean um, some baking trays, and then some measuring spoons and cups. And you can do so much with that. And feel free to check out like Walmart, Target. The dollar store has super cheap things. Um, so you don't need a huge set. I mean, if you have the budget for all this, go ahead, but <laughs> I don't, so. Um, back to my presentation here. Um, um, yeah, and if you don't have access to an oven or toaster, you can think outside the box. So if you have a microwave, you can do microwave meals. If you have a hot plate, you can do a ton of stuff with hot plates. You can make spaghetti, you can make macaroni and cheese. Uh, if you don't have anything, there's a lot of no-bake recipes out there. I have um, made a ton of no-bake recipes in my previous library because I didn't have a toaster oven or a hot plate, and the microwave was funky and old, and so <laughs> I didn't really use it. Is this not showing up for you guys? Yeah, it's just spinning. Oh, there it's kicking there in. You know, another um, utensil or um, appliance that's nice are those uh, electric griddles yeah. or electric skillets, too. Yes, exactly. And those don't have to be expensive. You can get the cheapest. No. <laughs> And those are things that some people have in their homes and never use and would probably gladly donate to the library. Exactly. Or you can check out, um, if you have a thrift store, Goodwill. Sometimes I found a really good um, cast iron um, skillet, actually, at our local thrift store for like four bucks. So, I mean, you never know. Uh, let's see. So if you have limited space, as I was mentioned, if you have a table, you can do a cooking program. Um, if you don't, you can do it outside. I honestly, in my previous library, had we had used our conference room, which had I think maybe like three tables, and I did a lot of demonstration programs. So they didn't actually get to cook, but they did learn about it, and then they got to eat it after. So, um, oh man, I was trying to check out the chat here and see if there's any more questions. Yeah, I'm keeping up with it, so don't worry about it. Okay, sounds good. 
Um, so food safety and allergies. Um, and this is always a pro, um, an issue or something that people think about. At my previous library, we had them sign a waiver that said basically, like, we're not responsible if you get sick. <laughs> um, and we had also had to um, be certified, like food safety certified. So we had to take a class and get recertified every, I don't know, year, six months or something. And here we're not, at the Sioux Center Library, we're not required to be food safety certified. Um, but we do, like, I try my best to, obviously, be safe with the food. So um, I always make sure they wash their hands, make sure the surfaces are clean. Um, and on our website, so we have all online signups. On there, they have a box they have to check that says, like, allergies I'm aware of. It could have possible feed the allergies. And they have to check that in order to register. If they don't, if they have a problem with that, they can always email me or our admin assistant. We can always work with them individually. Um, but when they register, we do have a way that says, okay, yes, I am aware that there could be allergies. Um, let's see. But I would stay away from potentially dangerous foods like um, cookie dough. Um, I know you can buy pasteurized cookie dough or um, pasteurized eggs, which you can use to make um, safe cookie dough. Um, actually, I have some of that in my fridge right now. But <laughs> I wouldn't. I would stay away from that. Just you just want to be better safe than sorry. Um, I've also seen some libraries. Um, some librarians who said, well, we can't, we can only use prepackaged food. Um, and to that, I would say, well, as long as the food you're getting from the store is packaged, like oatmeal, peanut butter, flour, I don't, I don't think it should be a problem as long as it comes prepackaged. So, um, give me a little bit, a little short in time. So I just wanted to Oh, here we go. So some books to tie into baking. These are some of the ones that I've used. Uh, here's some different cookbooks you can use. Um, these America's Test Kitchen Kids, these are really great cookbooks. Um, they not only have great recipes, it's also like very visually appealing, has lots of pictures, <laughs> um, but then they also have a lot of tips for kids who might be starting to bake or cook. Um, so we have both of those in our library. Um, this cookbook for teens I really like because it's written by teens. Um, I think they have a blog, these two teens. I think it was this one. Oh, no, it was this one here. I'm sorry. These are the ones. It's written by teens, and they're the ones that I think they have a kitchen blog. Um, here's I'm the books that we use. These in. are all linked. You're planning to share your slides, I assume, if you haven't already. Um, we're making all the slides available, so don't feel you have to write all these down right now because the slides will be available after the conference. So these look like great titles. I was going to ask you if you had any recommendations for collection development that were kid-specific cookbooks, so thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these are all, um, I think all of these have ended up in our YA section, but I'm pretty sure they could probably be put in your junior fiction as well. Um, and this was the book that we used, Love, Sugar, Magic, Dash of Trouble. Um, very sweet book. <laughs> I recommend that one. Pie in the Sky is another one. Uh, Chocolate, New Chocolate Factory, old classic. I could see some really fun programs coming out of that. <laughs> um, and again, there's so many others. But And then resources to check out. Again, the Free Library of Philadelphia Culinary Literacy Center. <laughs> And their toolkit has a lot more information about hosting um, food programs in public libraries. Um, programming Librarian has a ton of food programs that you can do. That's where I got the Secret Science Ice Cream Program. Uh, cheap Recipes. This PDF has a lot of um, really cheap recipes. So if you're on a budget, like a really tight budget, there's some ideas there. Um, this is just some general cooking ideas that I found will that could be helpful. Um, teaching science through baking, that one is geared more toward the little guys if you're using um, teaching or food to teach science. 
I was I think they goes up to maybe like fifth or sixth grade, but it always goes all the way down to like kindergarten or so. And then for older kids, if you are wanting to do STEM topics, there's a link for you and it goes really, really in depth. I mean, probably high school level and up level science. So, I mean, you can pick and choose what you want on that, but. Um, oh, I also wanted to mention, oh, sorry, do you have something? No, go ahead. Um, yeah, I also wanted to mention that at the end of this presentation, I did I did re attach some of my lesson plans for the baking club and some recipes and also that um, secret science of ice cream. So if you guys need inspiration or want to check it out, you can always check that out as well. Um, okay, so anybody okay. have any questions? Yes, you do. Um, I'm just going to jump in and mention um, extension. Every county has an extension office, and you didn't have that in your resources, but I'm going to go ahead and brag on extension because they can be really helpful for these kinds of activities mm -hmm. and often already have lesson plans, or they even have people that may be willing to come to your library and do a session. Um, so check with your extension office. Um, so we had a question, I think you answered earlier about how long your programs are, but if you just want to recap, quickly how long are your programs generally they're an hour um the baking and do club, you meet weekly no so for the baking club it was once per month so okay. it was going to be january february and march but then obviously the march one was canceled right. because of coronavirus <laughs> someone is planning to do a two and a half hour cooking camp for teens and is um, concerned that that might be too long i said well as long as you've got enough activities i think the time might pass quickly what are your thoughts yeah. on that yeah, that's what I would say. My first thought would be like, make sure you have at least like, so let me back up. Sorry. Um, so my mom's an educator and she always told me like, so however, you know, old they are, that's how long much you should like switch up the activities. So like if they're five, five every five minutes and you know, I, as you get older, it's a little bit, a little bit less applicable. So I would say as long as you have like activities every like 20 to 30 minutes, and as long as they're like different and getting up once in a while, I think that should be fine. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, someone asked, where do you get the food safety classes that you mentioned? Um, that was in Saipan. Um, so I'm not sure about here in the States, um, but that was through, uh, it might have been through the, like the food safety department there. I would think Extension would have information on that as yeah. well. Oh, and I see ag. Yeah. In Iowa, that would be a really great way to tie it to like 4-H in your agriculture. Yeah. Like if you have high schools or colleges, that could be a really great way to tie that into that. And then I think this came from someone at your library who is bragging about your online cooking demonstrations that you're doing oh. right now during the quarantine <laughs> time. So tell us a little bit about that. Um, so we did, we're doing a um, baking challenge right now. Um, where we're posting one recipe per week for four weeks and if they bake it and post a picture of it they get entered into a drawing to win one of those cookbooks. I think it was the test kitchen um, baking one that we ordered for them and so they it started off there was a few more entries at the beginning of the time and I think they might have forgotten about it by now so um, but we did that because they can't bake in the library anymore. So we just wanted a way to get them to keep baking. And then I'm also doing, um, every Friday I'm posting a food demonstration that I'm just pre-recording from home and putting it on the website. So, and that's just more general cooking. It's not really aimed at teens. It's just uh, spread some more cooking love. <laughs> Sounds great. And that's available on your library's website or Facebook page or both? Um, Facebook page. Okay. And your library Facebook name is what? Sioux Center Public Library? Yep. I think, yeah, if you type that in, it'll come up. I think it's maybe uh, like at Sioux Center Lib, but Sioux Center Library will pop it up. Okay. Wonderful. I think I caught all the questions. I just had a story. You talked about um, some of your activities while things are or baking or cooking that you do proper measurement and measurement comparisons. And that is so important. The funniest cooking story from my family, my oldest, I taught her some basic cooking skills and she mm -hmm. was doing well with it. So she was going to attempt to make rice pudding, which is a family favorite recipe for my mom. 
And evidently, my mom's handwriting wasn't real clear or the recipe was faded because it was so well used and loud. And my daughter put in eight teaspoons of salt instead of one eighth mm. teaspoon of salt. Um, and we've never let her live that one down. Oh my gosh. That's why I always tell them double check your, your yeah. measuring spoon. Yeah. And of course, an adult would know, oh, that's got to be a mistake. You wouldn't put eight teaspoons of salt in anything. I don't think. Right. Uh, but That's she so was young and just counted out those eight spoons. <laughs> Ooh, <laughs> yeah, I probably sound like a broken record. I tell them, check, double check, check, double check. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, I did see. I think what? I covered all the questions. Okay. People, if I didn't get your question, repost it now. Um, I think we're at or near the end of our time. Yeah, we've got about eight minutes left here. Um, I posted earlier in the comment, Emily, uh, you probably could add to this. Mm -hmm. I saw someone share on social media recently how vital those, uh, what used to be called home economics classes are. Um, family science, I think sometimes they're called now too. But cooking, sewing, budgeting, mm -hmm. um, gardening, those are all so vital right now during this quarantine time. And I think people are realizing the importance of that now. Uh, I chuckled, uh, and now it's really becoming somewhat more serious, but I chuckled when right off the get-go, people were buying up the flour and the yeast. I thought, do you mean to tell me that all these people who typically eat out are suddenly going to bake a loaf of bread from scratch? Um, mm -hmm. I, I hope people still have those skills, but I question that many don't. Um, so it's great that mm -hmm. you're filling in the gap now and doing this at your library. Yeah. So yes. And it looks like we have another catastrophe story here cooking. Um, somebody's daughter made brownies with way too much oil on accident. Couldn't figure out why after over an hour in the oven, they were still doughy. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. We once used at my mother-in-law's house, we made some brownies and we used olive oil, but I think it had like gone bad or something. <laughs> Mm -hmm. It tasted so bad. So also make sure your ingredients are not expired. <laughs> right. Because um, like baking yeah. soda, baking powder, that can make a big difference if the expiration. Um, Marilyn from Sherdan said they've shown kids how to uh, use different um, substitute tools, like using two forks mm -hmm. as a pastry blender. And Marilyn, I was raised that you used what, what we called a granny fork. Um, and it was an antique actually from one of my great grandmothers. That's what we always used in my household growing up as a whisk. We never had a whisk. We just used a granny fork. Um, and it was only as an adult that I thought, Oh, a whisk is what you really do with that. <laughs> so. I actually just use my hands for the pastry chef or for the pastry blender. Mm. I have a, do have like a cutter that I use for that, but I find that actually my hands work just yeah. even better actually. And oh. somebody's talking about uh, substitute ingredients. Yeah, I saw somebody mm -hmm. share on social media recently a substitute list for eggs because eggs are kind of often mm -hmm. hard to find right now. And there were so many substitutes that I had no idea could be used um, as a, a replacement for eggs. So yeah. that would be something maybe to toss in with your online classes right now, Emma. Yeah. Oh, there's so many great, I'm just kind of scrolling through the chat here. I could talk for days about cooking. I'm kind of sad that we're almost done. <laughs> yeah. And well, somebody's daughter made homemade um, noodles and they don't even have a pasta maker. That's impressive. Yeah. Wow. I've heard you can do it in a coffee pot. <laughs> or boil noodles in a coffee pot. Yeah. That's, that's, that's true. Yep. I've never tried it, but I've heard it works. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I wouldn't. It's not the best, I would say. <laughs> Yeah. Nice, nice idea. Yeah, we um and you know uh uh trying really hard to get them to start early, not even tweens too. I mean, I, you know, um, dug up some old, uh, was able to find like plastic knives, and just send them to work on chopping things and mm -hmm. doing cut meats, so they, so they know they're not going to cut their fingers off the next time yeah. they touch a knife. I mean, that little things like that. Yeah, you can use butter knives. Like, even, yeah, it still teaches them some really basic skills. So. Yeah. I think kids are just naturally drawn to cooking. I have a, one of my grandsons is two. And for his recent birthday, he got a little cooking set, a really nice little kitty cooking set, but it's stainless steel. It's super nice kitty set. 
<laughs> and he just has a ball putting the play food in there and stirring stuff and taking the salt shakers. And it's, it's nice to see him doing that, that it, at least he's getting those motions of how to stir something. It's like you said, it all ties mm -hmm. into culinary literacy. Um, mm -hmm. Much as we talk about print literacy, learning how to turn the pages of a book, you have to learn how to stir things and whisk things. And what's the difference between stirring and blending and whisking? Yeah, because they're all a little different. Difference. <laughs> yeah. So this looked like a lot of fun that you're having at your library. And I think you've encouraged people to do similar ideas at their <laughs> libraries. Um, soon, we hope, <laughs> when the libraries open back up and everything, um, people can come back in and do these kinds of programs. So thank you for sharing. Yeah. Uh, thank you. And uh, I'm glad to.